Hello, AJR fan base. My name is Matt Davenport. I work at Michigan Medicine, and I'm here today with Dr. Mike Corwin, who is an associate professor of radiology at UC Davis. He also happens to be the lead author on a study recently published by AJR called Clinical Importance of Incidental Homogeneous Renal Masses 10 to 40 Millimeters and 21 to 39 Household Units at Portal Venus Phase CT, a 12 institution retrospective cohort study. Thanks for being with us today, Mike. Thanks. So I'm just gonna show the audience what we're talking about here when we talk about masses that are part of your study. So Mike, can you see the screen here? This is an example of a typical mass we might encounter at portal venous phase CT. The mass is homogeneous. If we were to drop a region of interest measurement on it, it might come back as 27 Hounsfield units. And we might be left wondering, well, what do we do with this? Do we need to send it to an MRI to characterize it? And I think your study gets at this exact question. So maybe I'll turn it over to you and you can help us uh, understand what the study is, why we did it, and what led you to do it in the first place. Sure. The reason to do this study was because the lesion that you just showed, uh, I found to be very common in my practice. So you would have a CT of the abdomen pelvis in the portal venous phase for trauma or appendicitis, some other indication, and you would see an incidental uh, renal mass that was homogeneous, and you thought it was a cyst, you were pretty sure it was a cyst, but you would put an ROI on it and you would get greater than 20 Hounsfield units in this 21 to 39 Hounsfield unit range. So based on the ACR white paper recommendations, if you have such a mass greater than 20 Hounsfield units, the recommendation would be to get further imaging such as an MRI or ultrasound. And I was finding that most of these ended up being simple cysts. So I felt we were doing a lot of unnecessary additional testing. And there was some preliminary data out there suggesting that these homogeneous renal masses on contrast enhanced CT in this 21 to 39 Hounsfield unit range were almost overwhelmingly benign. So we wanted to do a large multi-center study to try and see if those results uh, held up. That's great. Now I notice in your title, you really emphasize the word homogeneous. Uh, can you help us understand why that word is so important? Sure, because if you have a heterogeneous mass with some septations or nodules, right off the bat, you're gonna be concerned for a potential RCC, a cystic RCC, and you're definitely gonna to wanna to get further imaging. So in order for this to be a simple cyst, it truly has to be homogeneous uh, on the contrast enhanced CT. Mm -hmm. So if someone's gonna be applying these results, if they encounter a mass just like the one I showed, but as subjective heterogeneous elements in it, your study really doesn't apply to them. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So you really have to scrutinize these before you put your ROI on it and start making a decision based on the household units alone. You have to subjectively scrutinize it and make sure they are in fact homogeneous. Now, one thing that impressed me was it looks like there's 25 authors on this paper and 12 institutions. Um, I've done some work before that's multi-center, and this is a this is a very impressive number of people and, and institutions. How are you able to get so many people pointed in the right direction, get so many people interested in the idea that you had? I think it's because a lot of those people had the same idea. Um, so I proposed this idea to the uh, Society of Abdominal Radiology disease-focused panel uh, on RCC as well as to some uh, collaborators who are not in the DFP. And the overwhelming response was that, yes, this is a, a common clinical problem that I encounter routinely. And so I think that enthusiasm behind the idea was uh, uh, key to getting so many people on board. Earlier on, you mentioned that in your practice, you see these come across your desk quite commonly, maybe at MRI. I understand you're the director of MR at your center. You see these cases come through your MR service and you say, gee, we probably didn't need to do this. How much does that, I guess, irritation is a word you could use? Irritation with a practice style, how, how much did that influence the behavior of you to do the study and also maybe the people participating? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the things that I try to uh, study tend to be things that bother me on a daily clinical basis. So things that come up and you feel they're probably benign or they should be one way, but perhaps recommendations say to do something else. Perhaps there are no recommendations. 
So very common clinical uh, dilemmas uh, are the things I tend to try and go after. And like we said before, I found out that a lot of other people feel the same way. If I'm a brand new investigator, maybe a graduating resident or fellow, and I'm looking around for ideas or things to do projects on, is that an area you would encourage them to focus on? Like what are the feelings that you have when you're doing daily work or the, the grumblings or irritations you might have about things you think just don't sit right with you? Yeah, that's right. In fact, uh, that's what I tell my residents and, and fellows. Um, if they're struggling to find ideas, just work. And things will come up throughout your clinical work day uh, that you don't have answers to, perhaps that bother you. And then you go to the literature and see what it says, see if there's any guidelines. And again, there may be no literature or guidelines, in, in which case it would be a perfect thing to study. Or perhaps what's out there doesn't fit with what your clinical experience is. And you might want to study it and see uh, if you come up with a different answer. Now, as people start to do projects like this, they might look at your 12 institutions and say, wow, I could never do that. What kind of advice could you give them around leadership skills or leadership tactics maybe that you used to get a bunch of disparate people to all be interested in the same thing? I realize they had common goals, but it's not so straightforward to get everyone to do all this work for you. Yeah, it's not so straightforward, but uh, you know, I was very impressed. All the authors put in so much hard work and they were very enthusiastic throughout the, the, whole, the whole project. Um, I think just being organized from the beginning is very important. Um, you have to have people who are bought in from the beginning um, and then just come up with a very detailed and well thought out study design before initiating any sort of data collection. Uh, because studies always tend to be a little bit more complicated once you really dive into data collection than, than initially thought. And so having a very detailed, explicit uh, study design uh, showing examples of how you do things and how you want things to be uh, assessed, uh, I think is very key. So it sounds like you did a lot of work up front on the methods, making sure that the study protocol was as detailed as possible and well vetted as possible before you made your first region of interest measurement. Yes, that's right. And just standardizing the data collection forms as much as possible so everyone's on the same page uh, throughout the study. So why don't you briefly summarize what you did and what your major conclusions were? Sure. So we ended up looking at over 12,000 uh, consecutive portal venous phase CTs, combining the 12 different institutions. And we first looked at the radiology reports. If the reports showed no lesion at all, we assumed that there was no relevant mass uh, on, in those cases. But otherwise, we actually did look at all the CT images and looked at the kidneys. And what we were looking for, again, were homogeneous masses on portal venous phase CT between 10 and 40 millimeters in this 21 to 39 Hounsville unit range. And so we were able to find uh, 514 CTs with 581 eligible masses out of that group, which ended up being about 4.2% of CTs, which is not insignificant number. So you can imagine 4.2% if you're on a busy clinical service reading CTs, you're probably gonna encounter one of these on a daily basis. And so out of those, we were able to get a reference standard um, for 346 homogeneous masses. And what we used as a reference standard was if, if available diagnostic renal mass protocol MRI or CT, we used ultrasound in some cases. We also used stability over time um, as one of our reference standards. And lastly, if none of that was available, we did use clinical follow-up to make sure the patient didn't develop any evidence of uh, clinical evidence of RCC down the road. And so out of those 346, we found that none were clinically important uh, supporting our hypothesis that masses in this range are highly, highly likely to be benign. That's fantastic. Now, when a paper comes out and makes a conclusion, sometimes the authors, authors will overstate the conclusion, and sometimes they'll underplay the conclusion. So if I'm reading this article and hearing your conclusion, what's the strength of evidence here? Can I take the information you're presenting and put it immediately into practice, or am I waiting for a confirmatory study? In my opinion, this is a definitive study, and we can take our conclusions and apply it to our practice immediately. Certainly, that's what I have done. Um, one caveat, though, is the attenuation range in our study was 21 to 39 Hounsville units. Our conclusion is that homogeneous real masses between 21 and 30 Hounsville units can safely be ignored without further follow-up imaging. At, and at portal venous phase CT, correct? Correct, on portal venous phase CT. And the main reason for that is our sample size in the 
31 to 39 pounds per unit range is a little bit smaller. So the data is not quite as robust in that range. And we feel it's reasonable to be a little bit conservative, conservative and keep 30 as that upper threshold. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So today I go and read a CT scan and it's a portal venous phase CT and I encounter a mass that's 10 to 40 millimeters and 21 to 30 household units and it's homogeneous. I don't need to do anything with that. I can just basically ignore it. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, that's exactly what we're suggesting. And again, that's what I'm doing in my practice. And uh, if we look at this conclusion in the setting of current guidelines, it's concordant with the updated 2019 uh, Bosniak criteria. So the exact mass that you just described, 21 to 30 Hounsville units that's homogeneous, is now considered to be a benign Bosniak II lesion. Uh, interestingly, though, this is discrepant from the uh, most recent ACR white paper guidelines, which, which do suggest further workup for any homogeneous renal mass on a contrast-enhanced CT that's greater than 20 Hounsville units. And the ACR guidelines predate the Bosniak ones. In other words, the ACR came out, the Bosniak said, now maybe we can push that number up, and then your paper is supporting what the Bosniak version 2019 is saying. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's right. And I think there, in between the ACR and the Bosniak, there were some smaller preliminary studies that also came to the similar conclusions that we had. And I think ours is just the larger multi-center, uh, more definitive study uh, to support the Bosniak recommendations. Now, if we think about the math on this, the math to me makes sense in the following way. If, there, if a simple cyst is going to be somewhere between maybe minus nine and 20 household units, and it requires 20 household units for you to get to definitive enhancement, if I encounter a mass, let's say like the one I showed earlier, that's let's say 27 household units, 27 minus 20 equals seven, and seven household units basically is a simple cyst. Is that the logic you're using here, this kind of mathematical logic, or am I just making that up? No, that's exactly right. And that uh, minus nine to 20 household unit range on an unenhanced CT, we know from prior large studies, uh, homogeneous les lesions in that range have been shown to be benign. So we're confident that those are benign cysts. So by that lo logic, you would, you would need uh, 20 or more household units of enhancement. So by definition, in the 21 to 39 household unit range, on a portal venous phase CT, they all should be benign. Mm -hmm. Now we know that papillary venous cell carcinomas sometimes can be hypo-enhancing or show no definitive enhancement at CT. How do we know we're not missing any papillary cancers lurking inside that, that range you're describing? Yeah, this is the big question. I think this is the main reason why this is such an issue is because we don't want to miss a hypo-enhancing, hypo-attenuating papillary renal cell carcinoma. So I guess I would say it's conceivable that out there somewhere in the universe, there is a papillary renal cell carcinoma that might measure in this attenuation range on a portal venous phase CT. But I think that's why uh, having a large multi-institutional study, uh, piggybacking on some of their smaller studies is so important to show that even if that is conceivably possible, it is so rare that it's probably just not reasonable to follow every single one of these to find the one in a million uh, or greater case. So you're making a population health argument that we're not going to manage to the rare diagnosis. We're going to manage to what's common. And as you pointed out, there's about four to five percent of all CTs are going to have one of these lesions. If we were to work every single one of those up, it might bankrupt healthcare. And in our search to find those papillary cancers, it seems to me like we got to focus on the ones that are heterogeneous. Whereas it'd be a little bit uncommon, for example, to have a homogeneous papillary cancer that measures in this range. Would you agree with that? Yeah, exactly. It would have to be homogeneous. Um, and, you know, furthermore, although it's variable, uh, we do know that uh, some papillary RCCs are quite indolent. So it's conceivable that even if we do miss the one in a million case, there might be no negative outcome for that patient uh, as the patient may um, have other comorbidities that uh, are more problematic than that small RCC. Now you use the term one in a million kind of as a rhetorical, but in your study, you sort of calculated the upper bound 95% confidence interval risk meaning what's the statistical certainty we have that that 0% prevalence of cancer is real? And I see in your paper that it's the upper bound 95% confidence interval 
So basically we feel comfortable that the risk of you missing a significant lesion or important lesion rather is less than 1%. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so again, we found 0%, but based on that 346 number, the upper limits for that 95% confidence interval is 0.9%. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share about your paper? No, I think we, we covered it. The, the, the main thing I want to emphasize uh, for those who might be watching is, again, uh, that our data applies to portal venous phase CT. Because what I see is a common mistake amongst my residents is that they will apply things like this to unenhanced CT or other phases of CT. And um, just want to make sure that that's clear to everyone as they apply this to their practice. Well, Mike, I want to congratulate you on your leadership skills with this. It's not so straightforward to have 12 institutions and 25 people all doing the same thing. And it's really impressive. So, and thanks for your time today to talk about this and hope you have a great rest of your day. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt.